Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before you. It's truly my honor to represent South Africa in these proceedings. I will be focusing on the nature of the rights that South Africa seeks to preserve through its application and the link between such rights and the measures requested. As well established in the court's jurisprudence, and most recently in this court's decision in the Gambia case, for the court to exercise its power to indicate provisional measures, the rights claimed by South Africa on the merits and for which it is seeking protection must be at least plausible. This threshold does not require the court to determine definitively whether the rights which South Africa wishes to see protected exist. Rather, the rights asserted must merely be grounded in a possible interpretation of the Convention, and the court must be concerned to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. Palestinians in Gaza, as a very substantial and important part of the Palestinian national, racial, and ethnical group, simply but profoundly are entitled to exist. As South Africa's ambassador pointed out in opening, to situate the right to exist and the threats to that right requires the court to appreciate that this application by South Africa is brought within a particular context. What is happening in Gaza now is not correctly framed as a simple conflict between two parties. It entails instead destructive acts perpetrated by an occupying power, Israel, that has subjected the Palestinian people to an oppressive and prolonged violation of their rights to self-determination for more than half a century. And those violations occur in a world where Israel, for years, has regarded itself as beyond and above the law. As the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories explained in 2022, and I quote, the occupation by Israel has been conducted in profound defiance of international law and hundreds of United Nations resolutions with scant pushback from the international community. That context is important, as South Africa made clear in its application. Where the international community has failed Palestinians for so long, and despite Israel's willful defiance of Palestinians' rights, South Africa turns to this court, seeking to protect the core rights of Palestinians in Gaza, to be protected from acts of genocide, attempted genocide, direct and public incitement to genocide, and complicity in and conspiracy to commit genocide. As the court knows, the convention prohibits the destruction of a group or part of that group, including through killing, causing serious bodily and mental harm, and inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the group's physical destruction. Through these core rights, the convention further protects the rights of its members to life and physical and mental integrity. Palestinians in Gaza, women, men, children, because of their membership in a group, are protected by the convention, as is the group itself. And the core rights are violated and threatened by a remarkable set of facts outlined by my colleagues and set out in detail in South Africa's application with supporting evidence. In the speeches to this court today, South Africa has chosen, as you've heard, to avoid the showing of graphic videos and photos. It has decided against turning this court into a theater for spectacle. It knows as well as your excellencies, the temptation for both sides in a dispute to parade pictures to shock. But South Africa's application in this court today is built on a foundation of clear legal rights, not images. The detailed material before the court is marshaled to show a case for provisional measures based firmly on this court's prior decisions. And South Africa advances its case on the basis that Palestinians' rights are equally as worthy of protection on the unprecedented evidence before you as those of the victim groups that this honorable court has previously protected 
by its issuance of provisional measures in the past. <coughs> the material confirms the rights in issue and their violation. That Israel has committed and is committing acts capable of being characterized as genocidal. You have heard from Ms. Hassim about direct extermination of thousands of people and children of the Palestinian population in Gaza since 7 October last year. And South Africa and the world together stand witness to the forced evacuation of over 85% of the population of Gaza from their homes and the herding of them into ever smaller areas without adequate shelter or medical care to be attacked, killed, and harmed. So, the rights are immediately and urgently in need of protection because of the ongoing denial by Israel of the conditions necessary for life. It is difficult, with respect, to think of a clearer or more abundantly urgent case. Arif Hussain, the chief economist at the United Nations World Food Programme, chillingly warned a week ago on the 3rd of January, and I quote, I've been doing this, he said, for the past two decades, and I've been to all kinds of conflicts and all kinds of crises. And for me, this, the situation in Gaza, is unprecedented because of, one, the magnitude, the scale, the entire population of a particular place. Second, the severity. And third, the speed at which this is happening, at which this has unfolded, is unprecedented. He concluded, in my life, I've never seen anything like this in terms of severity, in terms of scale, and then in terms of speed. Madam President, esteemed judges, the core rights on the evidence provided by South Africa in its application are demonstrably being violated. Multiple further statements by UN bodies and experts, as well as various expert human rights organizations and institutions and states, all of which is set out in South Africa's application, confirm as much. They collectively have considered the acts committed by Israel to be genocidal, or at the very least warned that the Palestinian people are at risk of genocide. Since the application was initiated, further states, 13 to date, including the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, representing 57 states, as well as other experts, have expressed their support for the case, thereby underlining the plausibility of South Africa's claim for provisional measures. For the purposes of the indication of provisional measures, the rights asserted by South Africa under the Genocide Convention and their protection corresponds with the very object and purpose of the Convention. Based on the materials before the court, the acts by Israel complained of are capable of being characterized as at least plausibly genocidal. As Mr. Nkonkai Tobi has explicated, the evidence of the specific genocidal intent is clear from the statements by Israeli government officials and soldiers towards Palestinians in Gaza and which may be characterized as at the very least plausibly genocidal. This at least plausible, plausible genocidal intent can also be deduced from the pattern of conduct against Palestinians in Gaza. It is also, again at the very least, plausible that Israel has failed to prevent or to punish genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to genocide, attempted genocide and complicity in genocide. And it is further plausible that South Africa has an obligation to prevent genocide, including by taking all reasonable measures within its powers to influence effectively the actions of persons perpetrating and likely to commit genocide or engaging in direct or public incitement to genocide. So let me be clear. South Africa's obligation is motivated by the need to protect Palestinians in Gaza and their absolute rights not to be subjected to genocidal acts. Notwithstanding the incontestably serious nature of the allegations against Israel, the court should not be required before granting provisional measures 
to ascertain whether the existence of a genocidal intent is the only plausible inference to be drawn from the material before it. That would amount to the court making a determination on the merits. Moreover, South Africa has stressed that any motive or effort by Israel to destroy Hamas does not preclude genocidal intent by Israel towards the whole or part of the Palestinian people in Gaza. Evidence of other motives explaining its conduct as a perpetrator will not save Israel from a finding that it also possessed the requisite genocidal intent. And because of a fundamental feature of genocide, namely that the prohibitions on genocide and associated offenses are used cogens in nature, they are subject, therefore, to no exceptional qualification. They are absolute in nature, in times of war and peace, always and everywhere. Furthermore, the fact that the alleged acts may also be characterized as crimes other than genocide should not exclude the plausible inference of the existence of genocidal intent. As the UN Secretary General has stated, the prevention of genocide is intrinsically connected to preventing crimes against humanity and war crimes, as these crimes tend to occur concurrently in the same situation rather than as isolated events. Consequently, he said, initiatives aimed at preventing one of the crimes will in most circumstances also cover the others. And as also set out in the ILC articles on state responsibility, the wrongful act of genocide is generally made up of a series of acts which are themselves internationally wrongful. Madam President, honorable members of the court, South Africa's claims thus concern in the first place its own obligations as a state party to the Genocide Convention to act to prevent and punish genocide. In the application, South Africa has stressed that it is acutely aware of its own obligation as a state party to the Convention to prevent genocide. Indeed, this court has recognized the universal character both of the condemnation of genocide and of the cooperation required in order to liberate mankind from such an odious scourge. As the prohibition of genocide is assuredly a peremptory norm of international law or use cogens, it is crucial that states pursue their interest under the convention in ensuring acts of genocide are prevented. Additionally, due to the special characteristics of the genocide convention, the respondent state owes this duty not only to the Palestinian people, but to all states' parties to the Genocide Convention, including South Africa. This has been emphasized repeatedly by this court and most recently in the Gambia case, where the court held, and I quote, all the states' parties to the Genocide Convention have a common interest to ensure that acts of genocide are prevented and that if they occur, their authors do not enjoy impunity. That common interest, said the court, implies that the obligations in question are owed by any state party to all the other states' parties to the Convention. Similarly, the Court has reiterated that in such a Convention, the contracting states do not have any interests of their own. They merely have one and all a common interest, namely the accomplishment of those high purposes which are the raison d'etre of the Convention. Accordingly, any state party to the Genocide Convention, and not only a specially affected state, may invoke the responsibility of another state party with a view to ascertaining the alleged failure to comply with its obligations, ergo omnes partes, and to bring that failure to an end. That means that South Africa is asserting both a collective and an individual right. It is thus beyond doubt that South Africa is entitled to invoke the responsibility of Israel under the Genocide Convention. Through South Africa's interest in the common interest, and as a state party to the Genocide Convention itself, it is entitled to safeguard compliance with that instrument. As has been explained, the events unfolding in Gaza at the hands of the Israeli forces are frighteningly unprecedented. Yet what this court is being asked to do in these proceedings, interdicting genocidal acts on an interim basis is sadly by no means novel. In relation to genocide, the court has indicated provisional measures in analogous circumstances to these in the Gambia case, where, as here, 
a state sought provisional measures on the basis of the ergo omnes right that the genocide convention be complied with. Also in respect of genocide, the court did the same in the Bosnia and Ukraine cases. And most recently, this court further accepted the ergo omnes character of parties' rights in relation to the torture convention. So South Africa respectfully contends that in this case, the rights of the Palestinians in Gaza are no less worthy of this court's considerable protective power under Article 41 to issue provisional measures. This court cannot but find, as it did in the Gambia case, where this court held that there is a correlation between the rights of members of groups protected under the Genocide Convention, the obligations incumbent on states' parties thereto, and the right of any state party to seek compliance therewith by another state party. South Africa's request therefore complies with Article 41 of this court statute and engages the power of this court to, prever, to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. South Africa requests this court to discharge that critical protective power. And South Africa does so by virtue of its own clear right and solemn obligations held towards the international community as a whole. For the court to indicate one or more provisional measures, there must also be a link between the rights, the protection of which is sought, and the provisional measure being requested. Such a link manifestly exists, we say, between the rights claimed by South Africa in its application and the provisional measures requested, which are directly linked to the rights which form the subject matter of the dispute. The provisional measures sought therefore ensure the protection of rights which might ultimately form the basis of a judgment in the exercise of the court's jurisdiction in due course. The rights at stake in these proceedings are certainly at least plausible, grounded in a possible interpretation of the Convention, and as the Convention imposes on parties the obligation to prevent and punish genocide under Article 1, and in doing so, intends to protect groups and parts of groups from genocide. The Convention was designed to protect both states' parties and human groups. When acts in breach of the Convention are perpetrated, it is the fundamental rights of people and the relevant group that are violated. Those fundamental rights of Palestinians in Gaza would be the subject of any judgment by this Court on the merits. Madam President, members of the Court, to find otherwise will not only be to treat Palestinians differently as less worthy of protection than others. It would also be for the court to unduly limit its own competence, to turn its back upon its extensive prior jurisprudence, and to close its eyes to the breach of the rights which lie at the heart of the Convention, and which breaches are taking place in Gaza right now as I close. Madam President, I ask you now to call Ms. Negrali KC to the podium, who will address you on a risk of further genocidal acts the risk of irreparable harm and urgency, and I thank you for your attention.